God is good, amen? Well, I wanted to let you know that Pastor Nick did send me a text, and you know, of course, I was here last night, and he's like, were you ready for tonight? I'm like, what's tonight? thought I would, you know, kind of wig him out a little bit on his pain meds. He did want me to share with everybody that he misses being here, and if you know Pastor Nick at all, he's chomping in the bit. Um, I know Pastor Mark and I got one email. He goes, okay, I'm in between the pain meds. Right now, I'm feeling good, and he wrote something, so he really misses being here. He's doing very well. He's starting to get up a little bit more and walk. The surgeon's surgery was a huge success. So just continue to lift him in prayer. Yes, praise God. Go right ahead. Amen. But continue to pray for him. As he did say, he's getting impatient. So we keep trying to encourage him rest. Take advantage of this time that God has given you and just be in his presence and allow God to minister to him. Um, those of us that are in ministry or even those of you that just work full time, it can be very draining. And so when you have an opportunity to set apart, it's good to allow God just to reach in. And that's our prayer, that he's just filled beyond belief above anything he could ever ask, think, or imagine with the presence of the Lord. And he's going to come back restored and refreshed, better and newer than when he went out. So it truly is an honor for me to stand here um, before you today and bring God's word. Um, Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you quicken our hearts. I just ask you, Lord, that it is not my words, that they're your words. I ask that you prepare our hearts to hear what it is that you are going to speak to us. Holy Spirit, we give you permission to move and and just make the word real. Just give us a greater revelation of the love that you have for each one of us. So, Jesus, we trust you through this time. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Well, I've been in the book of Ephesians for quite a while, and... I kind of joked with Pastor Nick, saying, how long do I have? Because Ephesians, I think, is like six, seven chapters. You know, I could be a while. He's, uh, well, Karen. <laughs> so I promise you, I'm going to pull out the highlights and not go through every chapter for you. <clears throat> but I encourage you in your quiet time to spend a little time in Ephesians. Ephesians, as we know, was written by Paul. And it was written while he was in prison, and it was written to the church of Ephesus. Many believe that even though it was primarily written to the church of Ephesus, it was also written with many other churches in mind. Ephesians 1, 1 actually says, To the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Have we found the PowerPoint? Dun, 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 dun. Bring it on. Oh, the title of my message. How could I forget that? Bring it on. Those of you that have any teen girls or young girls, there's a um, movie series called Bring It On, and it has to do with cheerleaders, and they come to this competition, and they're bringing it on, bring it on. That's what we're doing today. We're bringing it on. Hopefully it makes sense somewhere along here. I just like the title. Okay, so Ephesians 1, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Thinking that this was written to other churches, I took a little liberty and put to the saints in New Hope Palm Harbor, the faithful in Christ Jesus. We are faithful, amen? And we are in Christ. So this is going to be written for us today. Um, Ephesians basically is divided into two parts. First part, or two sections. First section deals with the redemptive work of Christ. The second section deals primarily with how we as believers are to live. Now, I would like to say that this is going to be a great revelation to you, but it isn't. This is, hopefully will be a reminder, and it's going to tweak us as, Lord, your Lord, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's what I need to do, and, and we're also going to look to how we're going to do that. So we're going to go through these kind of quickly. If we could bring up the first, I guess I could use my notes, I kind of count on the PowerPoint. Um, first scripture. Ephesians 1 4. We're to walk in purity and be separate from the world and the sin that so entangles us because he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy. Holy means to be set apart for him. Everything we do think or say should be focused and zeroed in around him. If he doesn't tell you to do it, don't do it. And blameless in his sight. Blameless means to be above reproach, to be free of fault. Doesn't mean we're perfect. But it means that every day we're seeking after him, and we as believers are above reproach. People should be able to look at us and see the love that we have for one another, the walk we're doing before him, and say, wow, what is that? The word says that they're going to know that we are his disciples by the love that we have for one another. Is that what we're showing the world? These are the things he's challenging us with. We're called to be set apart. 
Psalm 8411 says, The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk as blameless. He desires to pour out good on us. But there's a catch for those whose walk is blameless. That's my heart. I want his blessing. If you want to be shaken up a little bit, read Deuteronomy and see the blessing and the curses that come from obedience and disobedience. My heart is, Lord, I want to be quickened by your spirit to walk in what it is that you have for me. I want to be obedient to you. Am I perfect? No. (laughs) If you hang out with me any time at all, you'll know I'm not perfect. But that's my heart. God, I want to please you. I'm sure everybody here in this room wants to stand before the Lord one day and hear him say, well done good and faithful servant. Amen? Okay, 221 says, in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord, a temple in which God lives by the Spirit. We, as the body, are his temple. We individually are his temple. He lives in each one of us. Think about that. Now, when I used to teach the children, I used to say, he's with you even when you go to the bathroom. They'd be, ooh, Pastor Karen! But you know what? He is. Everything we do, everything that we say, every place we go, everything that we look at, he is right there with you. That just shake us up some days. If we think we're hiding anything that nobody's going to know that I did this or I said that, he knows. And he says he'll bring that sin to light. I don't know about you. (laughs) Some of the stuff I've done in the past, I don't want anybody to know. God, forgive me real quick. Get me out of this. You know, yeah, I told you I wasn't perfect. All right, we're also called, he wants us to do good works, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. He made you. It's pretty cool. And there's only one of you. To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Before the foundations of the world, he knew you would be sitting here in this place this time now. He has prepared things for you to do. Regardless of how young you are, remember the king that was seven years old? To regardless of how old you are. How old was Noah when he built the ark? He wasn't a spring chicken. Pretty old, five, six hundred years old. My mom, and I'm sure I've shared this before because she still amazes me, she's 87 years old. She and a woman that she works with who's 95 are responsible in her church. It runs about 400 people. When somebody passes away, they prepare meals. Well, they don't prepare, but they collect the food. They set it, serve it, clean it, and send them on their way. And my mom says, well, you know, when Gladys goes, I'm not taking over. (laughs) Mom, really? You're going to quit? You know, it's amazing to watch these ladies. So don't ever use age as an excuse. My mom taught kindergarten for 30 years. The children she taught have children. I mean, it's, you know, and when she went to quit that, oh, did I give her a hard time? Come on, Mom. Where's commitment? Okay. So don't use age. Don't use physical. He has things, regardless of where you are, that he has already prepared for you to do. That should get you excited. Walking with God is so exciting. You never know one day to the next what he's going to do, how he's going to do it. And you have to thank him for the opportunity. My car died on US 19. I'm going to go buy a washer and dryer because my washer broke. Now i got to fix my car. Hey, God, what are you going to do? I'll tell you some other time, but what he did was amazing, and I love that. Okay. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but to give you hope and a future. Hide it in your heart. Hide that word. Put it on your mirror. Do whatever you need to do to remember. He's got good things in store for you. He also calls us to love. Ephesians 5, 1, 2. Follow God's example as dearly loved children. Walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Do we love that way? The person next to you going through some stuff, you're going through some stuff. He's telling us to lay down our life for one another. Love is his example. Live in righteousness. Oh, I missed one. How could I miss it? We have to become mature because we're already mature. We're going to go up. I missed two. 
Boy, I really jumped. Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, this is a lived a life worthy of the calling. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble, gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Humble. Each one of you have a calling. Humble. Total, complete dependence on God. Apart from him, I can do absolutely nothing. Gentle, the words that we speak. We have to be gentle with one another. I'm guilty of this. Sometimes you get a little bit too comfortable with people. I mean, you're a little sarcastic. You get a little joking. You have to be sensitive to that and gentle in that time as well. And be patient with one another, bearing with one another in love. And this is where it's talking to the person next to you. They're going through things. They're not perfect. They haven't arrived. You haven't arrived. We need to be patient with one another. Take our time. Understand where they're at. You know the old thing. We have two ears and one mouth. Listen more. Hey, how you doing? Do you listen? Or is that just a passing thing? Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Cannot emphasize unity enough. What does the enemy want to do? He wants to come in and cause division. And if you've been around me any time at all, you heard my goose story. And if you've not heard it, you're going to hear it. I love this. This comes from the world. Obviously, it's a biblical principle. Imagine that. But this really talks about teamwork. When you see geese flying along in a V formation, you might consider what science has discovered as to why they fly that way. As each bird flaps its wing, it creates an uplift for the bird immediately following. By flying in this formation, the whole flock adds at least 71% more um, flying range than if each bird flew on its own. How much stronger will we be when we're all going the same way? People who share a common direction and sense of community get where they're going more quickly and easily because they're traveling on the thrust of one another. Picture a rowboat. You ever done the rowing? You ever seen it on TV where, you know, the colleges and they have those teams? What if each one of those people decided to row a different way? Not going to get anywhere. It's no different in the church. When a goose falls out of formation, it suddenly feels a drag and resistance of trying to go it alone and quickly gets back into formation to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird in front. If we as much sense as a goose, we'll stay in formation with those people who are headed the same way we are. You're here because God's called you to be here. Our head, our leader is Pastor Nick. We submit, we fly in formation, we follow him. Are there going to be things that you disagree with? Yeah. <gasps> Gasp. But yeah, we're people. We have our own thoughts. You know what? Keep your thoughts to yourself and take them to God. God is the only one who can change a heart. If you and your heart of hearts believe that this is just the wrong direction, A, go to Pastor Nick, and then B, stay in prayer. But you don't go to the person next to you and you don't go talking about it because then we're going to be like in that rowboat going every which way and getting nowhere. Um, when that head goose gets tired, it rotates back in the wing and another goose flies point. It's sensible to take turns doing demanding jobs, whether people or with geese flying south. Geese honk from behind to encourage those up front to keep up their speed. What message do we give when we honk from behind? Now I'm going to listen to all you honking later. Finally, and this is important, when a goose gets sick or is wounded by gunshot and falls out of formation, two other geese fall out with that goose and follow it down to lend help and protection. They stay with the fallen goose until it is able to fly or until it dies, and only then do they launch out on their own or with another formation to catch up with their group. If we have the sense of a goose, we'll stand with each other like that. We need each other. Our world is a very lonely world, yet we're not going to admit it. How you do it? I'm great. Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. We are, but we want to get beyond the surface. Remember the picture of an iceberg? You have the iceberg up here and what's below, what's holding it up? That's where we want to get. And I challenge each one of us, if you're ever driving or you leave church and you, you know, I wonder, where's so-and-so? I haven't seen her or him for a while. Don't just let it go out of your mind. Make a note when you get home, find the phone number. Call us. 
They, hey, you know, have you seen, yeah, you know, actually she's home and she's not feeling real well. Why don't you just call her and pray for her? That would be so wonderful. Take those promptings from the Holy Spirit so we reach out. We don't admit it, but we want to know that we're missed. Maturity. Until we all reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Let's grow up. It's time to grow up. Strive to live a righteous and godly life as we walk the path he's put before us to fulfill his purpose. And then the love I mentioned, live in righteousness, Ephesians goes on and says, do not sin in your anger. You will be angry. It's going to happen, and that's okay. But what do you do with it? That's our challenge. And then Christ tells us he wants us to be holy. He wants to make his church holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Why? So Christ can have a church without stain. He wants to present us to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. But again, he wants us to be holy and blameless. I've said it many times, the problem with the church, and I'm not talking about this, uh, but the church. In our culture today, it's getting to where there's not much difference. It's almost scary to say you're a Christian because what does that mean anymore? And we need to really get before the Lord in our own individual hearts and say, God, I want to make a difference. I want when people look at me to see you. I want to see other people, not through my eyes, but through your eyes. And we sang it, and we heard the word, seek him first, seek him first. That's what he's calling us to do as a church, so we can make a difference in the world, in our individual worlds. So how do we do this? Um, finally, in Ephesians 6, Paul goes on and talks about the armor of God. Soldiers put on the armor when they went into battle. Paul's sitting in prison, and the day when Paul was around, there were all kind of sold Roman soldiers. Well, he's looking around, and he sees this, and he thinks this makes a great analogy of what's happening in the natural to bring it into what's going on in the spiritual. Any of you served in the military here? Just raise your hand. When you were serving, would you go out into battle as you're being prepared? Nothing on? Would you just walk out there? Oh, you want me to? Okay. Would you just walk out there? Would you? Did you? No? Why not? Yeah, you're, you're probably not going to survive too well if you just walk out there in your jeans and your t-shirt, hey, I'm here for battle, right? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a war buff, but I think you'd be in trouble. Well, we are in a war War comes from a conflict, generally over territory, control of a territory. We're in hostile territory because this is not our kingdom. This is the kingdom of darkness. The one over this land is Satan. This is his. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's what the Bible tells us. And I'm so thankful this is not my home because it's really a mess. I want to be in heaven where there are no tears, no hurt, no pain, no nothing but glory, walking on the streets of gold, praising Jesus all day. I'm in. But you know what? I'm not there now. He's calling me now to live holy and blameless, mature, and walk in unity, and finally to put on the armor of God so I can battle. What am I battling? Not flesh and blood. Is we're wrestling against the principalities of the world. I'm flesh and blood. You're flesh and blood. I'm not battling Sandy. Now, Sandy might think one day, she, you know, I offend her because I don't say hi to her, but it's not me. Those are the thoughts of the enemy, and those are the things that we need to grow up and mature and recognize and pay attention to our thoughts. I've started again, and I had to repent that I got a little like, kind of lax in some of this. You, know, you get comfortable. We know the right things to say. We sing the right words. But I'm now putting on the armor of God every day. The belt of truth, the belt of truth. What did the belt do in the armor with the soldiers? It held everything together. It wrapped around. It was also the place where they put their sword. If they didn't have their belt, what did they going to do with their sword? The belt of truth, the truth that wraps around me. It's the truth of his word. It's the truth of who he is and what he's done. Some people can have the word of God and not have the truth, and they can make some reckless decisions. So I want the truth. The breastplate of righteousness, what does that do? That was the metal that protected my organs. The breastplate of righteousness protects my heart. 
underneath it because it was so hot because of the metal and the fabric. They wore a robe underneath it. I'm clothed with Christ. His righteousness, because of what he did, I can stand before God in right standing. Then I put on the feet of readiness. You ever try to walk on rocky ground? I was at the beach the other day, and there's shells. Ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh, man, where are my flip-flops? You think I'm paying attention when I'm walking in that kind of terrain? I'm going to share the peace of Jesus Christ? Is that my sure-footed? No. God, I want to have your feet, the feet of readiness, so I can share the peace of Christ and who you are and walk in any terrain that you've called me to walk. The sand spur is not going to throw me off course. The shield of faith. The shield of faith. Okay, I'm going to admit it. A while back, I saw that movie 300. Any of you guys ever seen this awful movie? Oh, my gosh. I want to know. This is terrible. Forgive me. I just, I want to know when you're filming a movie and a head is cut off and it goes, oh, cut. Head didn't go the right way. Sorry. I'm just curious about that. Okay. Shield of faith was tall and it was wide because what does it do? As the arrows came, it protected them. And in that army, the geese, okay, we're all goose here, they would have the shield here, and then I don't know how they did it. They'd line up and go back, and they'd not only have the shield here, but it'd also be over their head. They were fully protected. There wasn't anything that was going to come to harm them. The enemy schemes to try to come at us. Well, no matter what fiery dart he's going to throw at me, I have faith and trust. I know who Jesus Christ is, and it's not going to hurt me. That's the shield of faith, the faith in him and him alone. And we sang that today. Helmet of salvation covers our head, protects our mind, protects our thoughts. Things are coming at us every day. What are we listening to? What are we watching? God, with that helmet of salvation, you protect what goes into my soul. And then the sword, the sword of the Spirit. That is the word of God. It is alive, it's powerful, it's active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Often in the day with the Roman soldiers, the sword would be used for personal and for enemy. They would split wood, they would prepare food, and I also read where, I don't know if I can get this down exactly how, because I have this pretty cool, cutting ropes that bound captives to set them free. I'm like, oh wow, that's cool in the spirit. Imagine the word of God, how we are called to see people set free. He wants to use us in that way. How's that going to happen? It's through his word. The word of God comes to divide good and bad, right and wrong. That's how we're judged. The armor, put it on every day so we can stand, stand, stand. We're in hostile territory. If you don't think you're going to have any challenges... I don't know what you're drinking. Because <laughs> you're going to have challenges. Because it's not our world. And there's a battle for souls. I don't want to go out there any different than an, our, a soldier would in the natural. Yeah, I'm ready. Bring it on. <laughs> I'm going to last 30 seconds. But I want to go out there in his armor, ready to stand and do whatever. The battle is his, though. We're going to look real quickly at Jehoshaphat. I'm not going to read the scripture for the sake of time, but it's Chronicle 2, 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. And I'm sure a lot of us know the story. Every day now, for quite a while, I've been putting on the armor. And we've all heard that little story and little thing we say, we kind of chuckle at, you know, God, it's been a good day. Haven't, you know, offended anybody, haven't done anything wrong, haven't thought anything wrong, and oh, well, you know, now my feet are going to hit the floor, and oh. So you know what? I'm half asleep putting the armor. I want that armor on before my feet do touch the floor. And what I'm finding throughout the day, things, I, the thought, they're coming. I'm like, whoa, wait. No, I'm not going to entertain that thought because you know what? I have the helmet of salvation. I'm delivered. I'm healed from that. No, it's not going to enter in. So I challenge you, if you're not, get back. Some of this is basic stuff. But let's face it, we kind of get to a certain point where, you know, we think we sometimes arrive and that complacency is the enemy. So let's get back. Jehoshaphat. 
This is really a cool story. People came, men came and told him there's a vast army coming. They're in their surrounding. They're going to come and destroy us. He called the town of Judah together. Said, let's seek the Lord. Let's go into a fast. Jehoshaphat started praying, reminded God of all he had done. Comes down to the point where he says in verse 12, O our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. You ever feel that way? <laughs> Got my armor on, but I sure don't feel like I can handle this one. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Anytime you see the word but, forget what's before it. So forget the fact that you don't know what to do. We all know that. But our eyes are upon you. Our eyes on you. Our eyes are on you, Lord. That's why we have the armor. We're going to stand in the battle. God, I don't know what to do. I can't handle this. I can't believe this is going on again. But you know what? You do. My eyes are on you. I'm going to trust you and I'm going to listen for you. And then came a prophet who said, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. But God, have you seen them? Are you nuts? I've said that before. <laughs> For the battle is not yours, but it's God's. The battle is not yours, but it's God's. God goes before us. Tomorrow, march down, and he told them what to do. Fine, you'll find them there, but you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position and what? Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. He will do it. What are you battling? Your life? In your family? What's going on? The Lord will deliver you. He tells us to stand and put our eyes on you. Put on our armor, trust him, look to him, and wait for him. We get in a hurry. God's not moving quick enough, so I better do something. I better have a plan B in case God doesn't come through. God will tell you what to do, and he'll tell you when. So he says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. You're not alone. Remember, he's with you. You're his temple. And what happened? Jehoshaphat got up, and he said, you know what? Listen to me. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you'll be successful. He sent troops out ahead of time just to sing and praise God, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. While they were doing that, God set ambushes. The enemies among each other. And what did they find when they got there? Dead bodies. They didn't have to fight. We don't have to fight. It's his battle. We have to remember that. And I challenge each one of us to pay attention to those thoughts that come along. God's word, his voice, is peaceful, encouraging, loving. It's not condemning. It's not judgmental. So what are we listening to? And as soon, I just ask by his spirit that we're quickened. Oh, wait, God, that's not you. I gotta listen to that. I have the helmet of salvation on. No, my faith is in you. Put that shield of faith up so you are not tempted by anything because your faith and your hope and your trust is in him. He has good things in store for us. And as a church, I don't know if you've heard yet, but we're in the very beginning planning stages. There's a mobile home park near here. And we've been in, we've talked with the manager. She's given us carte blanche, go in, Use our clubhouse, men, Bible study, women. Do whatever you want in here. And it needs a lot of help. Spiritually, it's just spiritually in the natural. It just needs a lot of help. How exciting to think that we're going to go in there and see that area transformed, not for us, but for him and his kingdom. Now, do you think the enemy is going to be going every corner? Oh, go do hope. Yeah, go in there. Share Jesus. No. 
He's going to do everything he can to get us mumbling and grumbling and da 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 and work and this and who knows what. All those fiery darts, all those thoughts, but remember the geese. We're going to fly together, we're going to flop together, we're going to row together, and we are going to stand in him to see his kingdom move forward. Amen? He's called us as a church body to make a difference, not for us, but for him. So put your armor on, look to him, trust him, and then expect God to act. When my car died on, well, I prayed it wouldn't die at 19 in Curlew, get me to the little U-turn lane. So I got in the U-turn lane. Ah, sorry, I know what happened, excuse me. I'll just hold it. And it died. I shut it off. I sat there as hot as I'll get out and just sat there and waited. Okay, God, I have no idea how you're going to handle all this. I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know how we're going to pay. Whatever, Lord. While my car was getting fixed, I still went and bought my washer and dryer. Okay, Lord, and by the days out, I saw what he had planned and how he had that done. Because I had peace. God, are you sure you're going to do this? I go, okay, I'm going to trust you. Because I'm not trying to go buy stuff if you don't have the peace of the Lord in doing that. But he knew because, real quick, God is outside time. Here's the beginning, and here's the end. He's up here. He sees it all. Me, I'm stuck here, and I see this little bit. So if my eyes are on him, and I have a peace about what he's calling me to do and where I'm headed, he sees the end from the beginning. He knows what pieces he's already worked out that I don't see, so I'm going to follow and trust him. So we're going to close. I'm going to, when, after I pray, just encourage the prayer team to come up. If there's a battle you're in, you want some help, you want some healing, some deliverance, you want some prayer, we're here. But I encourage us by the Spirit, stir ourselves back up, seek him, put the armor on and say, God, I'm dressed and ready for battle. Bring it on, because I'm here to be used of you. Father, we love you. We trust you. Your goodness, your grace, your mercy, just ask that you just pour it out in an overabundance, not for us, but for you. Holy Spirit, I ask that you quicken within our heart as we leave here today, the things that we watch, the things that we say, our thoughts, that we are fully clothed in your armor so we can stand and see what you want to do in us and through us. Jesus, it's all about you. We want to be used. We want to follow you. We want people to look at us and to see you and say, wow, I want that. And that's you. It's love, Jesus. I know the darkness that you brought me out of. Help each one of us to be used to bring people out of that darkness into your kingdom, Lord. We love you. We trust you. And I speak a blessing over each person here today, each family represented. Stir us up, God, with the things that break your heart. Jesus, we love you and we trust you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. My prayer, we're here.